So Merry Christmas 2023. My goodness, where did the year go? And so uh, I wanted my message to be a bit different this morning because I think this is an aspect that uh, maybe some of us don't realize and some of us do realize, but we don't realize the impact of it. And so uh, did you know that there is a feast in your Bible and the Jews call it Hanukkah? And some of you have heard of it because you have, um, you know, you're more American-minded, so you've heard of it. Generally in the world, it's the Americans that celebrate it more outside of Israel. Uh, but Hanukkah is actually the biblical celebration at this time of the year in December. In fact, um, Hanukkah just ended recently. And so next year, Hanukkah is going to be on the same uh, day as Christmas Eve. That's next year. So uh, that will be interesting. And so Hanukkah is not found in the Old Testament of your Bible. It's actually found in the New Testament. Wow. And so you know a lot of the feasts of God are in the Old Testament. Uh, but this one's in the New only. See, in John 10, the Bible says, um, the feast of dedication, that is Hanukkah, uh, was in winter right now. Look at your neighbor and say right now. Jesus was in Jerusalem, and he was walking in the temple uh, courts in Solomon's colonnade. And he actually gave a Hanukkah message in uh, verses 24 to 38. My sheep know my voice, right? This is the message of Hanukkah. Do you belong to Jesus? And so that's what he was doing. So Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. And so that's what we've been doing for several years now, celebrating Hanukkah. Hanukkah is the true festival of lights because it celebrates, Christians should celebrate it because it's in the New Testament, number one. Number two, Hanukkah celebrates the restoration of the temple in Jerusalem because the Greeks had come, they had desecrated it. They put a pig on the altar in the temple. How horrible. And so they, the Jews fought back and took back the temple, cleansed it, and then they lit the menorah, the lampstand. And the lampstand was supposed, the oil was supposed to burn for eight days. But they only had enough for one. And they said, oh God, by faith we're going to light it. Because it'll take eight days to actually consecrate, make holy the oil before they could use it. So they said, by faith, we're just going to light it on the first night. They lit it, and it continued to burn for eight nights. That's the miracle of Hanukkah. And so that's why it's the festival of lights. That's why you turn the menorah, the uh, seven-stem menorah, to the nine-stem menorah, one for every night, and one to light the others. Isn't that amazing? And so we're not trying to be Jewish at all, but we're trying to celebrate the festivals found in the Bible because we're the people of God. We are the wild olive branch. Anyone here a Jew? I don't think so. We're the wild olive branch that was grafted into the tree of Abraham. So whatever is for the Jews is for us, the Christians. So don't hate the Jews. Anyone standing with Palestine? I want to whack your butt right now. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, because Palestine is not a true nation. It's a region. It's like saying, we're Southeast Asia. We demand our rights. You're not a nation. Palestine is an area, a territory. And God gave the land of Israel to the Israelites from day one in your Bible. And the Lord said to Abraham, Anyone who blesses you, I will bless. Anyone who curses you, I will curse. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't want God to curse me. <laughs> so whatever reports you're reading about Israel, they're not true. Someone comes to bomb Malaysia and we fight back. They say, Malaysia, you're so bad, you, you, you hit them. That's the whole thing. They bombed Israel on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the highest, most joyous day of God's calendar. And they did that to them. 
The enemy did that to Israel. We've got to stand with Israel as the people of God. This is not taught enough to the Christians. So if you've been brainwashed into supporting Palestine, stop it right now. Go home, repent. Repent right now. I repent for standing with Palestine when I should be with Israel. And so Malaysia with Anwar Ibrahim saying, you know, all the Palestinian things, do you know? The only nation we cannot visit on our passport is Israel. We curse Israel. We get cursed as a nation, everybody. So that's not a very wise move at all. You got to know God is on the move. Who was it? Turkey, was it? Was it Turkey recently? The MP stood up in parliament. Israel fell down dead. Fell down dead. Heart attack on the spot. 50 something years old. Look at your neighbor and say, God is serious. Tell your neighbor, don't play play with the word of God. All right, sorry for my um, <clears throat> brief commercial break. I didn't mean to do that. It came out. But the truth is the truth, and we get set free by the truth, right? Come on. It's because we're not taught we are supposed to bless Israel. But you say Israel is so bad. Hey, excuse me, you defend yourself, you're so bad. You bomb my house, I cannot hit back. I have to stay there and say, bomb me some more. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The law never requires you to do that. There's such a thing called self defense, it's a defense. And by the way, I'm a lawyer. I know what I'm talking about. Practicing lawyer. <laughs> Teaching the word of God. All right, so we're, here we go. Okay, sorry. Back to my message. Let's cool down. So where did Christmas come from, right? So, oops, I keep pressing the wrong thing. What did I do? Oh, here we go. What about Christmas if we're talking about Hanukkah? Well, we know Christmas is not in your Bible. What? Christmas is not in my Bible? Yeah, it's not in your Bible. If you check early church history, you will find the early Christians never celebrated Christmas for the first 300 years after Jesus went to heaven in Acts 1. Never. So if they don't do anything, we should be watching and looking. Where did Christmas come from? Remember church history, most of you know it. In the year 313 AD, Constantine became emperor of the Roman Empire. He was a worshiper of the Roman sun god, Taiyangsun. And what he did was he had a dream or a vision in which he apparently saw the sun and the cross together. And he presumed Jesus must be the same as my sun God. So apparently he prayed to Jesus, help me win the battle tomorrow and I shall make Christianity the main religion of the Roman Empire. And indeed he won his battle the next day. And indeed he made Christianity the national religion of the entire Roman Empire. But he had many, many religions in the empire to contend with. And in order to compromise, he took a little bit from every religion and he came up with his idea of church. And he did all these things not from true belief in Jesus, but for his own authority. So one of the things he did was to make December 25th the birthday of Jesus. In actual fact, that day, 25th of December, was the birthday of the sun, his sun god. So can you imagine you're a worshiper of Guang Yin, and then now you're trying to say you're, you've become Christian. So now you take Guang Yin's birthday to become Jesus' birthday. Boleka. Mana bole. Tida bole. And that's what he did. And so we ended up with the Christmas tree, with Christmas stockings, with Christmas lights, with Christmas decorations, and presents. Whoops. Now, all of which have nothing to do with the supposed birth of Jesus. Look at your neighbor and go, oh my. <laughs> it's all been highly commercialized. And unfortunately, we love every bit of it. Now, is there anything wrong with that? Let's see. Worst of all, we ended up with Santa Claus, who is supposed to be Father Christmas. Look at your neighbor and go, what? <laughs> he is supposedly assisted by elves in the North Pole making presents for children who have been good and not naughty during the year. <clears throat> so children write tons and tons of letters to him every Christmas asking for the presents that they want. Do you know in the Western nations, in the post offices of the Western nations, they have tons and tons of letters every year written by children to Santa Claus and they don't know what to do with it. Oops, sorry, you didn't know Santa Claus doesn't exist. Sorry. 
The truth sets you free. <laughs> anyway, he then, Santa, then supposedly puts on, puts on his red Santa suit and flies all around the world, hear this, on his open sleigh, brrr, drawn by flying reindeers. The last time I checked, reindeers did not have wing, uh, wings. <laughs> In the middle of winter and probably snow too. He is supposed to be a big fat old man who gets into your house through your chimney. Oh no, we don't have chimneys here. With a big sack of presents on his shoulder. Now the problem is, how is he supposed to squeeze through it? And what if there is a big roaring fire in the fireplace? How will he get down that chimney into the fire, into your house? So I'm sorry, how ridiculous is that story? Do you know it is a lot harder to believe in Santa Claus than it is to believe in Jesus? Seriously. Santa, who? Did you know that the word Santa has the same letters as Satan? So just because we are used to it does not mean we should believe or celebrate the Santa story. Then what about the nativity story at Christmas that the shepherds and the magi, the three wise men, came to see baby Jesus at his birth? Are you ready for more truth? <laughs> Don't worry, we're still going to celebrate. John 8, 32. Come on, read with me. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Who said this? Jesus. So if he says it, it's the truth. Now, a careful analysis. If you go and look at your Bible, check it carefully. It clearly shows December 25th is very unlikely to be Jesus' birth for two major reasons. One, we know from the Bible, this is from the Bible, Luke 2, shepherds were in the fields watching their flock at the time of Jesus' birth. And this passage literally argues against the birth of Christ occurring on December 25th. Because the weather was so cold, it would not have permitted shepherds to be in the fields at night. You couldn't possibly. At night some more, in winter, shepherds were not in the fields during December because December is cold and rainy in Judea. So it is likely they would be inside in a barn or somewhere else. And Luke's account suggests Jesus may have been born in the summer or the late fall of every of the year which is autumn number two jesus's parents remember they had to go to bethlehem to register in a roman census luke 2 in your bible the romans said you have to go back to your hometown and register yourselves such censuses could not be taken in winter because the temperatures would drop really 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 low below freezing the roads would be in very poor condition icy and slippery and dangerous for travel. And so taking a census in such weather conditions would be self-defeating. In other words, many people would not go back home to take the census. Then the Roman government would not be able to have proper records that way. So given the difficulties and the desire to bring pagans into Christianity, then you got to know this. The, the, the Emperor Constantine wanted to make December 25th the date for Jesus' birth to actually compromise with paganism. So those who worshipped his son God would find it easier to accept Jesus. The Bible says that when Jesus was born, it's likely to be autumn. Autumn. Uh, and so it would be, you, how do we find that? From the birth, conception and birth of John the Baptist. Did you know John the Baptist was his cousin? Interesting, right? And so the Bible says in Luke 1, because Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, she was already six months pregnant when Mary conceived Jesus. And we can then calculate from there. And John's father, Zachari Zacharias, he was a priest serving in the Jerusalem temple during the course of Abijah, Luke 1. And so if you calculate that, that would correspond to June 13th to 19th that year. He would be serving at the temple. You know, the priests had a roster that you would go this time, I would go that time, etc., right? And it was during this time the angel appeared to Zechariah and said, your wife is going to conceive a baby. And he went, what? 
We are both so old. And the angel said, mm, because you do not believe, you shall not be able to speak until he's born. Oh, my. So, indeed, he had the message. And, and the angel said, when he's born, you're going to call him John. Ah, no one in my family is called John. <laughs> that was the message. So, he went home. And if, if we look at it, imagine if he went home and he got to work straight away. <clears throat> uh, following the angel's directions. And... Um, Imagine that Elizabeth will conceive literally at the end of June. And if you add nine months to that, John the Baptist will be born at the time of March. So if you add another six months, remember he was already six months in the womb when Jesus was conceived, right? If you add more time to that, Jesus' likely birth is actually September. No later than our time, October, because it is the Feast of Tabernacles. When God comes to tabernacle with us. He comes to dwell with us. In other words, you cannot have, if you are the God of the universe, would you have your son just Ching Chai born anytime? Ching no. Chai. No. You would have your son born Jun. Very specific, important date. And the Feast of Tabernacles is the time when God comes to dwell with his people in the tents, in the wilderness remember that and God commanded them celebrate it every year to remember I come down to dwell with my people build tents for me and that's the time Jesus came because the word of God says in John 1 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us so that is likely to be Jesus's birthday September slash October because our calendar is not the calendar of God. God's calendar follows the moon. The world's calendar follows the sun. So, therefore, this date is not Jesus' birthday. Oh, what about the Magi? Well, you all know the three wise men. Did you know if you check your Bible, it never mentions three? Look at your neighbor and go, oh my. <laughs> the Bible simply says, wise men from the east. Matthew 2, 1. And so they were most probably from Babylon, where Daniel had been commanded by the king of Babylon to actually teach them the times and seasons of God. So he had to train the astrologers, etc., right? Those who performed these, uh, you could call it magic for the king. And so they were the spiritual hoo-hoo people. And by the time the magi came to G see Jesus, it was likely he was about two years or older. So the actual thing is he did not, they were unlikely to see baby. They probably saw a toddler already. Just because Matthew 1 says she gave birth to a son and gave him the name Jesus. Matthew, uh, sorry, Matthew 1 says that Matthew 2 starts by saying after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, does not mean it's the same time frame. Mm. Why? Remember, it took a long time to travel in those days. Excuse me, you got to travel that way, you know. And so one place to another, you either walked or you came on donkey or horse or camel or something, right? And so just because Magi saw the star when it rose, Matthew 2, 2, did not mean they would immediately know where to go. They would have to check all the records of the word of God for where the king of the Jews, the Messiah, would be born. And so after all of that, they would have to travel from the east. So again, December, seriously, you want to go on a camel to travel in December in winter? No. And so it'll be too cold to travel. So it was very unlikely. And so Robert Heidler wrote a fabulous book called The Messianic Church Arising. In the book, he says this. Some people think if we celebrate biblical feasts like we do, we celebrate all the biblical feasts. We, uh, and, and why do we celebrate biblical feasts? Because the Bible says... For generations after you, you shall celebrate these feasts that God has ordained. Not humans, but God has ordained. And remember, we are the wild olive shoot grafted, grafted into the tree of Abraham. So whatever God ordained for the Jews is for us. We, I'd rather celebrate God's feasts than the feasts of the world. So some people think if you celebrate biblical feasts, you must celebrate, uh, stop celebrating traditional ones like Christmas. My, and Robert says his belief is as followers of Jesus, we are free. Tell your neighbor, free. free. To receive Christmas as a wonderful celebration of God's love. 
And so the Lord has never led Robert to teach against traditional holidays, but to present the blessings of the biblical ones. Now, where they are, they're at GOZ, Gloria Zion. This is Apostle Chuck Pierce's church. Uh, they really, really celebrate the biblical feasts, but they also have a wonderful time at Christmas. While Christmas is not part of God's original cycle of feasts, there is good biblical precedent for adding new holidays to celebrate the great works of God. Imagine God did a wonderful work in your family. Imagine he healed somebody, like, you know, the doctor said she'll die, but then the person was really healed. You could celebrate that date every year. God, uh, God healed grandma or whoever, right? And so nothing wrong with that. And so both Purim in the Bible and Hanukkah in the Bible, they are holidays added to God's yearly cycle of feasts by humans to remember God's deliverance. And so if it is valid to institute a new feast to celebrate a great work of God, then, of course, Christmas qualifies. Tell your neighbor, ooh, right? Also in the book, he said, while there is good evidence Jesus was not actually born in December, it's not wrong to celebrate Jesus' birth at Christmas. Tell your neighbor, phew. <laughs> Read with me loudly. It's always a good time to celebrate Jesus. Amen? See, Christmas provides a wonderful opportunity to remember God so loved the world that he gave his son, John 3, 6, uh, John 3, 16. Now, while the traditional date of Christmas probably had pagan origins because it was the birthday of the son, I believe we are free to redeem the date and just use it to celebrate God's love for the world. Anything wrong with that? Nothing whatsoever. So in Robert's family, they celebrate both Christmas and Hanukkah, a double celebration, and so do many of us, right? Now, some more in the book. Many people ask him, is it okay to have a Christmas tree? Is it okay? And you see, the, uh, his answer is, a tree symbolizes many things. But of course, people point out, you know, pagans, uh, they cut down the tree, uh, they make idols with it, you know, so it's not a good thing, like what Jeremiah 10 says. But you know, a tree can have godly symbolism. And trees are made by God and display his beauty uh, of creation, right? Jesus died on a tree. You know, we always call it the cross, but you got to remember, it was a tree. Gayuma, it was a tree. And so he died on a tree to redeem us. Some versions of the Bible say the word tree. And we are promised one day we're going to eat from the tree of life. And you're never going to die again. How fabulous. So a tree, if you light it up with pretty lights and all of that, deco and all of that, it's a beautiful reminder of what the shepherds saw uh, that first um, time they saw Jesus, a baby, right? Every believer, you've got to follow your conscience. If you really feel you should not celebrate Christmas, God bless you. If you feel you can, God bless you. Because the Bible doesn't forbid an extra celebration. But personally, many of us, we found Christmas is a wonderful time to remember God's love to send Jesus, right? And so, do we still like Christmas? Yes, yes of course. Can we celebrate Christmas? Yes, yes of course. Uh, but... Let's celebrate it for the right reason and not the wrong reasons given by the world. Now, you know, the Bible says the world means Satan. The devil's been influencing the world. So shout to your neighbor, celebrate Jesus, celebrate. Amen. That's why. And that's why when people send me all these Christmas messages, I send them the one. Jesus is the reason for the season. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, so what is the right reason for celebrating Christmas? At Christmas... We celebrate the fact. It's a fact. Tell your neighbor, historical fact. That Jesus came. He came to earth. Serious. John 3, 16. Read again with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not die but have eternal life. And so, God knew we humans, could you save yourself? He knew you can, cannot save yourself. He did what only the one true God could do. He came to earth to be born human. Why? So he would have a 
body. Why? So he would have blood to shed for us. Why? Because blood is the only punishment acceptable to the holy God for the sins of the world. That's the whole point. See, many people treat sin so lightly. Oh, I, you know, I'm going to sin and one day God is just, yeah, yeah, yeah. You love me, right? Okay, la, let me in la. into heaven. No, it doesn't work like that. You see, God is the holy God. Therefore, he cannot tolerate sin. He loves us. Yes, he hates our sin. He cannot even allow one sin to go into heaven. Now, let's calculate. If you are the best person in the world, you never sin. But every day you got one lousy, bad thought, evil thought. You want to do what, what? I want to kill that guy. I want to mm, have sex with that one. I wanna, mm, mm. Just one bad thought a day. In 365 days, in one year, how many sins do you have? 365 sins. Imagine you live to 100, multiply. How many sins do you have? 36500. You stand in front of God and for judgment. You can enter or not? That bole. One sin also cannot enter. Heaven is sinless. Heaven is pure, holy, like the holy God. He has called us to be holy like him. And so, he will not leave the guilty unpunished, the Bible says, Exodus 34. And the wages of sin is death. You sin, you die. Meaning, go to hell. You sin, you die. But very fair. But. And so, thank God. Tell your neighbor, thank God. He gave us a way of salvation found in no other God, no other religion. Every religion says you have to be good to go to heaven. Christianity is the only one that says you can never be good enough to go to heaven. Look at your neighbor and say, you cannot save yourself. That is the truth. You cannot save yourself. You see, you're so good. One lousy thought, you're done. One bad, sinful thought, you're done. You know, the standard is so high. Jesus said, if you think in your heart, ooh, I'd like to have sex with that woman, you have committed adultery with her in your heart, as if you have done it. That is how high the standard is to enter heaven. And so, there's no way you're going to save yourself. And you know what I always say? If you can save yourself, you're so good, you must be God, let me worship you. No way. There is no way. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. That's it. And so God knows we cannot save ourselves. You know what the Bible says? We are only made of dust. You know you're not even made of earth, soil. If you were made of earth or soil, uh, when you die, uh, we can use your body to plant flowers. <laughs> we can sell your body for earth, you know. But no, you're made of dust. Dust to dust when we die. And so God knows this dust is not very good at saving ourselves. He knows. You just can't. Oh, excuse me. How do you know I'm made of dust? Everybody. Hey, I'm Monday twice today. Oh. Still God. You're made of dust. We are nothing until God breathes life into us. When it takes the life away, we go. That's the whole point. So life is given by God. So the one true God did for us what no other God did. He came to die on the cross on our behalf. So we would not have to die for our own sins and go to hell. That's the whole point. The other gods tell you. There was one time I was preparing this and the Lord said, do this, tell everyone. The other gods tell you to be good in order for you to go to heaven. But you know what the other gods tell you? They say, you be good. Huh? You keep worshipping me, huh? but you be good. And you go heaven by yourself. Good luck. Whoa, 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 I worship you all. You cannot help me go heaven. No, 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 you, you, you be good. I asked the Muslims one time, I asked a few Muslims, how do you go to heaven? We don't know. Huh? Uh, we have to be good. Lah. So, so, so do, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? No. Huh? What happens? Well, when we die, uh, we stand in front of God, He will tell us up or down. I said, what? If it is down, that's our fate. Muslims believe in fate. That's our fate, Lord, like too bad for us, Lord. Whoa, look at your neighbor and say, I don't want that. The Bible says it is written so you will know. You got to know. And then, you, and then you, when time comes, you say, God, I'm ready. You cannot be like, I don't know. Oh, I hope, I hope I'll go to heaven. 
Oh, I think I'll go to heaven. You cannot do that. This stuff is real. Jesus talked more about heaven and hell in all the four gospels than any other subject. He talked, he gave stories, talked about it, taught it more than any other thing. Why? Hell was never created for humans. It's the worst place. Any one of you still believe hell has 18 levels like the Chinese believe? That's a big fat lie. You know, you know, Chinese think like this. I'm not so bad. He's worse than me. He's going to the deepest one. I'm going to, I'm going to the top level. I'm not so bad. I'm a little bit bad only. La. So I got top level. Top level is I got mahjong to play. I can drink wine. It's just a bit warm la, because heaven is, uh, hell is hot. La. But he, uh, he go to the burning one. La. He, 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 he bad. <laughs> Oi, there are no 18 levels of hell. It is not in the Bible. The Bible says hell right now is pure darkness. Pure darkness. We actually have a man in, in, in Cebu who went to hell 11 days and, and then woke up and tells the story. Hell is pure darkness right now. He was, he, his wife had intercessors, pray, 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 pray for him for 11 days. Finally, he woke up in his hospital bed and he says, I've been to hell and back and I am so scared now. He had the fear of the Lord. His whole life, he had no fear of the Lord. He suddenly had the fear of the Lord and began to worship the Lord for the first time in his life. A very rich businessman in Zebu. And so hell is real. But the Bible says there'll be a second hell. And the second hell is the one with fire and worms to eat your flesh daily. So it's burn, 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 eat the flesh. How enjoyable is that? Does that sound like mahjong? Wine? Or for the Muslims, nine virgins to serve you? It is not like that. That's the lie of the devil. And so we got to know the truth. Hell was never created for us. It was created for the fallen angels who knew and saw the glory of God in heaven and yet rebelled against him. So they would be cast down, definitely. But if you choose to be on the side of the devil, it's very fair that you go to hell with him. So it's your choice. God created humans the highest of all his creation. He gave us choice. We're not robots. Yes, master. Yes, master. We're not robots. We, are, we were created with choice. We think like God, feel like God. We are able to do things like God. We hear him. We say what he says, do what he does. Or if we hear the devil, we'll do what the devil does, then we'll say what the devil says. So this is the whole point. So Christmas is a wonderful time, but you got to remember the purpose for all of this. Amen. So... If we were to die for our own sins, it'd be over. And so the other religions do not help you at all. So there are not many roads to heaven. I used to think there are many roads to heaven. The Muslims go to heaven, Buddhists go heaven, whoever go heaven, Christian go heaven, atheists also go heaven. No, 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 no. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to Father God except through me, Jesus. Why? He's the only God who died for you. No one else died for you. Every, all the other false gods tell you, do it yourself. Good luck, but keep worshipping me, okay? That's not what we should be doing. So shout to your neighbor, Jesus is the only way. Jesus. So am I saved if I go to church? I go to church every Sunday, you know. When you walk into McDonald's, do you become burger? No, when you walk into KFC, do you become chicken? No, how come you walk into church, you become Christian? Huh? <laughs> Logic, right? This is how you become saved to go to heaven. Every person has to receive Jesus themselves as their personal Lord and Savior. Why? The Bible says in Romans 10, if you openly declare, say with your mouth, Jesus is my Lord. And you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. He's not dead on the cross anymore. He's not dead in the tomb anymore. He is seated in heaven at the right hand of God. You will be saved. So it's a two-part thing. One, say with your mouth. Two, believe in your heart. I cannot examine your heart, but I can hear the words of your mouth if you will say it. So there are Christians, uh, there are people when they receive Jesus, they say, I shy lah, I, uh, I won't say lah, I say my heart. No, 
The word of God is openly declared. Why? You got to hear it. The devil has to hear it and leave you. The, and God and the angels have to hear you and come near to you. Okay, they can hear you. God can hear your thoughts and the prayer of your heart. But it is good to declare. The Christianity is a faith by declaration. You declare. I declare I now belong to Jesus. Devil, get away from me. Don't touch me. That's your faith. And that saves you. It is by believing in your heart, you and God become reconciled. It is by openly declaring your faith, you are saved. So you got to open your mouth to become saved. Come on. Have you ever received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you ever said with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believed in your heart, God raised him from the dead? If you have, Romans 10, 9 promises you, you are saved. Hallelujah. But if you have never said with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you have never believed in your heart, God raised him from the dead. By the way, it's a historical fact. More than 500 people saw Jesus alive after the tomb. They saw him alive, saw the nail uh, holes in his hands and feet, and then saw him bodily taken up to heaven. It's a historical fact that he, raised from, he was raised from the dead. Or oh, you're not sure if you ever did that. This Christmas, we invite you to do so now. So that you receive the best present of all, the gift of eternal life and salvation provided by God himself. Are you ready to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? Do you know you only need to say this prayer one time, really from your heart, that Jesus is my Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And you will be saved. Now, we're not going to ask you to put your hand up. Are you saved? Because, you know, we don't want everyone to look at you. Ah, oh, you're the only one in the room, ah. We don't want anyone to look at you like that. So we're all going to say this together to help those who have never said it. Shall we do that? Are we ready? Can I invite you to sit straight and loudly proclaim? Come on. One, two, three. Father God, I confess that I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I now know that you are loving and just. You love me, but you must punish my sin. But the punishment for sin is death. Out of your great love, mercy, and grace for me, you sent your only son, Jesus, to die for me so that I would not have to die for my own sins. I repent. I repent of my sins and I ask you, Lord, to forgive me. Right now, I receive you, Lord Jesus, as my personal Lord and Savior. I declare that only you can save me. I ask you to teach me your ways so that I can obey all your commands. This Christmas, I thank you, Father God, for giving me the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Woo! Do you know the gift of eternal life starts now? No, when you die, you go to heaven. It starts now. The moment you receive Jesus, everything you do on earth earns you rewards in heaven. Did you know salvation is only step one? After this, you got to do things God's way. Speak His way. Feel what he feels. Why? Because then you get rewards. You don't want to go to heaven and then you got zero reward. And then you become panjaga pintu in heaven. I don't want to spend eternity doing that. Do you know the life on earth is so short compared to eternity? Eternity with God or without God is the choice we make in life. After we die, too late. Because when you decide that, you're going to spend eternity somewhere. You don't just poof, disappear. That's too easy. There are consequences for how we live life here on earth. And so eternity is a long time. Let me tell you how long. Forever and ever 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 and ever. Forever and forever, forever, forever. No stop. It doesn't stop. It does not end. So I definitely don't want to spend even one minute Burn, 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 worms eat. Burn, 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 worms eat. Oh, oh, by the way, the Bible even says this. You know, hell is even worse than that. You think burn, 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 worms eat not so bad? Let me tell you one other thing. No friends. You are alone. 
in hell you burn alone. That in itself is going to make people go cuckoo. You will go crazy just because you're all alone for eternity. That happening. So you don't have to have, uh, you don't have to be very smart to know you don't want to go to hell. You don't have to be very smart. You just have to know, oh boy, I don't want that. And the lie of the devil is you get to heaven, you sit on a cloud, play a harp and eat grapes. How boring is that? The Bible is very clear. We rule in heaven with Christ. That sounds much more interesting than sitting on a Do you understand? So it doesn't take more than two brain cells to know you don't want to go to hell and you definitely want to go to heaven. Even if you're just going to sit on a cloud and eat grapes and play the harp. It's still better than boom, boom, boom. Worm, worm, worm and no friends. <laughs> Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, let the truth set you free. So if tonight the world ends, will you be in heaven? Yes. That's your assurance. Be not like the Muslims. I don't know. I stand in front of God. He tells me up or down low. Too late by then. Amen. So what's the right reason for celebrating Christmas? At Christmas, come on. At Christmas, we celebrate the fact that Jesus came in bodily form. The gift of eternal life is better than any present you are ever going to receive on earth or at Christmas. So we rejoice because of that. Amen? Indeed. Come on, shout with me. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. That is, that is what we have to understand at Christmas and any other time. I don't mind celebrating the birth of Jesus at Christmas or any other time. I love it. I walk into the shops and they go, and they're playing, joy to the world. Yeah, okay, okay. The Lord is coming. Yeah, yeah, my Lord, my Lord. Yeah, my Lord. <laughs> you celebrate my Lord, Bagus. Go and do it. As long as you're playing these songs that say, Jesus, the Lord, uh, I'm happy. You can celebrate him anytime. Right? So everyone shout this again. Come on, louder. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate. Amen. Whole year, 365 days you can celebrate. So what is the right reason for celebrating Christmas? Jesus, the Son of God, the only Son. By the way, if I were to die for you, ooh, uh, Chinese say what? Uh, you understand? Oh, you uh, make such big sacrifice for us. Yeah, yeah, I die for you. But if I were to send my son, and I only have one son, if I were to send my son to die for you, you know how much that hurts me? Way more precious than my own life. I can die for you by my son. No, no, no. But God sent his most precious. He has nothing higher than his son. Nothing better. Even though the whole universe belongs to him, his son is the most precious. And he gave that one son that we would live. That we would live. That's the whole point. And that's why you got to hear the truth. Embrace it and say, God, yes, I need you, Jesus. And not, I'm okay, oh. I'm a good person, but what's wrong? What are you saying? Do, 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 do not do that. There is no other way. There is no other way. He came specifically from this wonderful, beautiful baby at Christmas that we always love to celebrate to this. He came with a purpose to die. If he did not die, oh, woe to us. Because there is no other way. He took stripes on his body. That's the true picture. The Bible is clear. He took stripes on his body. They beat him up so bad. He had blood everywhere. So any of you who keep seeing the beautiful pute pute chante chante Jesus on the cross. Itu bukan cerita benar. That is not the true picture. The true picture is this. He was beaten so bad. Why? Isaiah says he has to be beaten to take all your sickness on him. So he didn't. Come just to get you to heaven eventually. Ticket to heaven. No, he came so that you would not have to carry sickness while on earth. So the gift of salvation, the eternal life, the blessings, the benefits starts the moment you receive Jesus. And so he had to endure that first before dying on the cross. That's why he was so weak, he couldn't carry the cross himself. He was so beaten until the Bible says, Dida macam orang lagi. He wasn't human anymore. The way they beat him up, that is already considered pretty. 
pretty. So that baby that we celebrate at Christmas came to die. The purpose, sole purpose to die for us. So we would not have to die. And the Bible says Jesus considered it and said to Father God the night before, if possible, take this cup of suffering away from me. If possible, but not my will be done, but yours. He submitted to Father right to the end. Was it easy? No. He was 33 years old in the prime of life and he gave up his life for us. Why? Elsewhere in the Bible it says that he, gave, he decided to go for it for the reward, for the benefit of the multitudes that will come into the kingdom of God. For that. He said it was, it's worth it for all the multitudes of people that will be saved because of what I do on the cross. And he endured it. It was not easy. It was the hardest thing anyone ever had to do. And he did it. And no one else could do it. I going up on that cross for you, no use. I'm as sinful as you are. No one else could have done it except God himself. Jesus is God like his father. Amen. And so, in this house of the Lord, let's wish each other, come on, tell your neighbor, a very, very merry, merry Christmas, Christmas and a new year filled with God's big blessings. Amen, amen, and amen. Woo! Thank you, God.